Hello everybody, today we'll talk about frequency response function. A frequency response function, or commonly known as FRF, is a function used to quantify the response of a system to an excitation normalized by the magnitude of this excitation in the frequency domain. So as the name suggests, it's a frequency-based measurement function. It is used to identify the natural frequencies or the resonant frequencies, damping and mode shapes of a physical structure. So FRF is a transfer function between the input and the output. Basically, it is nothing but the ratio of output to a given input. Now, if I excite a structure, I'm giving an input, and the structure will respond by, you know, giving an output. So if I divide the output by the input, I get the frequency response function or the transfer function. So it expresses the frequency domain relationship between an input and output. Now, frequency response function is not dependent on time. So what is the purpose of FRF? Well, the main purpose of FRF is to solve noise and vibration discomfort. Now, let's say you, you're inside a car, and let's assume for a simple case that the engine in an automobile is the main source of excitation. And let's say the chassis is the medium between the source and receiver. Of course, there are many more, but then let's uh, make it a simple case. Now, it is very important to ensure that the chassis does not resonate with the engine meaning the chassis will have a natural frequency of its own. And it's really important that the engine, as it is the main exciter, does not excite the chassis or does not provoke the chassis to vibrate at its natural frequency. Now, what will happen if the chassis starts vibrating at its natural frequency? Well, the consequence is either it can break if, if it's too weak or if the, the vibration levels are too high, or uh, in most cases, uh, you as a user inside the car will get the noise and vibration discomfort. So it's really not good to get those discomfort, especially when you're driving. You need to focus on driving. So that is the main purpose. We do not want to have high noise and vibration uh, excited by the engine. So there are different types of FRFs based on excitation. First is a structural FRF, wherein uh, the input excitation is in force as in structural force and the output is either displacement velocity or acceleration. So you're exciting the structure uh, and capturing the vibrations. The next is the acoustic FRF. Here the input excitation is an acoustic force, meaning a sound source which you know interacts with an obstacle. It's also commonly referred to as volume acceleration. And the measured output is sound pressure. So this is the acoustical FRF. And combined FRF is you either give a structural or acoustic force an input, and the output is either acceleration or sound pressure. We'll study these in detail. So the structural FRF, you know, at the end of the day, FRF is nothing but output by input. So structural FRF is obtained by impacting a structure with an impact hammer. So because we're going to give a structural force, so we use an impact hammer and it stri and strike the structure of interest and measure the response of a structure with an accelerometer normalized by the injected force. So let's say we impact a structure with a hammer and then we have connected an accelerometer on the structure, which is going to capture the vibrations. And the more important thing here is normalized by the force. So let's say... Uh, if we hit a structure with an impact hammer. Now, it is really difficult to have the exact same force every single time. I mean, we're only humans, so we can't get the exact same force every single time. So it will change. But then we have to make sure that uh, the change in the impact force should not influence our final result. So no matter how hard you hit or how gently you hit, you mean the denominator, how how hard you give the force or how gently you give the force, it should not, uh, you know, really change the acceleration. Because then the, the, uh, the transfer function will become a function of the force. So in order to ensure that we normalize the force, and we'll see in greater detail in this video, but then simply put, we need to ensure that no matter how hard or how gently you hit, it shouldn't influence the final result. So the next is the acoustic FRF. It is nothing but you're impacting the structure with an acoustic force and measuring the sound pressure level. So in this case, you're not having any accelerometer connected, but rather you're, you know, when you excite the structure with an acoustic force, the structure is going to vibrate and those vibrations are going to create sound waves. We're capturing those sound waves.
you know, and measuring the sound pressure level. The next is combined FRF. Now, combined FRF is you're impacting the structure either with an impact hammer or acoustic force and measuring either the vibrations or the sound pressure using a microphone. Now, there are certain cases where and this will have an advantage. For example, let's say if there's a small uh, gear whose natural frequency you intend to find. Now, you can't really use structural FRF because if you impact and you have to paste an accelerometer, now, let's say the gear is small and you connect an accelerometer, you might influence the readings because uh, the accelerometer will not only add weight to the structure and thereby, you know, make the readings wrong, it'll also prevent the structure from vibrating itself. Maybe the accelerometer would act as a damper to that structure. So, it's, not, it's really not a good way to capture the natural frequency, but if we give an input impact using the impact hammer and then capture the sound waves emitted by that part, we can get an insight into the natural frequency of the structure. So in that situation, this method proves fruitful. The same with a bell. Let's say you want to find the natural frequency of the bell. You can connect an accelerometer provided the bell is huge, but then let's say if it's a small bell, you simply strike the bell with a clapper and measure the sound waves emitted by that part. It is a natural frequency of that bell. So let's talk about the experimental setup for FRF measurement. So let's say there is a test specimen. In this case, it's a rectangular plate. So first, we connect the accelerometer on the point of interest. And then the accelerometer is connected to the data acquisition system. Then we connect the impact hammer to the data acquisition system. And we use BNC cables to connect the sensors. These are all ICP sensors. And then we need to figure out the impact location. Where do you want to strike? And you have the workstation connected to the data acquisition system with the LAN cable. So now we'll be hitting at different locations and measuring the response of the structure using that accelerometer. Now there are different ways to do this. There is a roving, roving accelerometer method and a roving hammer method. So roving accelerometer is you keep impacting at a same location, but then you just you know, move the accelerometer at different points in the structure. And roving hammer is place the accelerometer at one position and keep moving the hammer at different locations. And this schematic is representing the roving hammer method. So a few more things to know before starting a measurement is connect all the BNC cables properly, ensure the sensors are all calibrated, input the proper sensitivity value of accelerometer and hammer, and most important, give proper directions for all accelerometers and also the direction of your hit of intended impact. Now, directions become very important, especially when you want to calculate mode shapes. If you uh, make a mistake in giving wrong directions, and that can give totally different results when it comes to mode shapes. So keep an eye on that. So how do we excite a structure? Well, a structure can be excited in multiple ways. We know that there are different types of FRF, such as structural FRF, acoustic FRF, combined FRF, but we'll talk more about structural FRF. Let's say I want to impact, uh, uh, excite a structure, uh, you know, so by using uh, an impulsive signal. Now, an impulsive signal can be delivered using an impact hammer. The thing with using an impact hammer is that it requires good skill to deliver really good impacts by exactly striking once. Now, it so happens that many times when trying to hit at difficult locations, our hand trembles and we hit twice. So that is called as a double impact. And there are software features available to exactly detect such double impacts so as to not use for your measurements and processing. But yeah, it does take uh, skill and lots of hitting at different difficult locations to achieve a really good impact. So why do we use an impulse signal? An impulse signal is characterized by being narrow in the time domain, but pretty broad in the frequency domain. So when we, you know, use an impact hammer and strike an object, we're, you know, we're literally giving an impulse signal. So which means our frequency response is pretty broad. So we're exciting with a broad range of frequencies. We're giving broad, you know, multiple frequencies to the structure in a short span of time. And then we expect the structure to respond to that. So if you're exciting for, let's say, 0 to 1000 hertz, for example, this, and if the structure has a natural frequency somewhere in between, it's going to respond to that. So this is one of the reasons why we're giving an impulsive signal. So we're giving multiple frequencies and we're going to figure out what the, how the structure responds to that input. 
Bandwidth is a difference between upper and lower frequencies. Now the input spectrum or the input force spectrum should be flat with versus frequency, meaning it should excite all the frequencies uniformly. Now it's important to know up to what upper limit can the impact hammer provide a flat frequency response. Now there are many limitations based on what part you hit, what kind of impact hammer tip you use. There is silicone tip, rubber tip, metal tip. So each of those have different upper limits of frequency. And this upper frequency defines the bandwidth and hence the scope of the measurement. So if your upper frequency is lower, then you can perform measurement only within that frequency band. Now look at this graph. It's a graph of normalized force versus frequency, and it's the hammer bandwidth. Now in this case, the hammer has a bandwidth up to 900 hertz, meaning up to 900 hertz, it can uh, you know measure properly. It can give it can get a flat frequency response, but beyond that, it cannot excite properly. So it's really important to know up to what bandwidth can be ex actually excite. Let's say we performed our FRF measurement by impacting the rectangular plate and we captured the response of the structure. It'll look something like this. This is not an actual measurement, but it's shown for illustrative purposes. However, we can uh, get lots of information from this plot. First is we can get information on resonances. So if there are peaks in the plot, they indicate the presence of natural frequencies of a structure. So we did excite the structure with an impulsive signal an impulsive signal has a broad range of frequencies. We don't know what the natural frequency structure is beforehand, so we excite with multiple frequencies, but the structure picks up one particular frequency because it is a natural frequency of the structure. The structure wants to vibrate at that particular frequency, and it shows up as a peak, which is the resonant frequency of the natural frequency of the structure. Now, damping is proportional to the width of the peak. White peak indicates large damping, narrow peak indicates less damping. We also get information about mode shape and phase. The amplitude and phase of multiple FRFs acquired to a common reference are used to determine the mode shapes. And phase plot, which you don't have here, provides information about phase relationships between different frequencies. Now, these are again illustrative purposes for what a mode shape would look like for a rectangular plate. These are not actual mode shapes, but then you can get a clear picture of how the structure would vibrate. Uh, you know, how each part of the structure would vibrate relative to other parts. So in the right figure, you can see that there is, you know, maximum amplitude in the center and the edges, whereas minimal amplitude in between. So it means that the center and edges are going to vibrate more relative to other parts. Now, if you want to learn more about mode shapes, there's a whole playlist in the link in the description below. Now, let's say a general structure would have more than one natural frequency and it'll have multiple natural frequencies. It'll look something like this. So you have multiple frequencies. Uh, sometimes the, you know, you, uh, the second or the third frequency may be integral multiple to the first frequency. In that case, it, there are harmonics. If you want to learn more about harmonics as well, you can check the link in the description below. So another important thing is coherence. Coherence indicates how much of the output is due to the input in FRF. So it indicates how repeatable the measurements are from hit to hit. Coherence ranges from zero to one. A value of one indicates that FRF amplitude and phase are very repeatable, and a value of zero indicates that the measurements are not repeatable. Now, the, you know, when you're actually performing a test, you, you do see the FRF and coherence together. When the amplitude is high in the FRF plot, means there is resonance, the corresponding coherence should be close to one. And when amplitude is low, anti-resonance, it means the coherence should be close to zero. So again, illustrative purposes, something like this, when there is a peak, the coherence should be close to one. When there is a dip, it should be close to zero and not zero. So to conclude, FRF is a transfer function between input and output. It is basically the ratio of output to input. It is used to identify the natural or resonant frequencies, damping, and mode shapes of a physical structure. All right. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great day.